Getting good exposure on your footage is just one of the first steps to building your fundamentals in video creation. All cameras have settings to control exposure and they're broken down into shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. Every time you take a photo or video in any environment, you're going to use these three. Cameras even have dedicated buttons and dials for them, and understanding how they work individually and collectively will help you build good technique with a camera, especially for filming manually. So we're gonna take a deeper dive into the three, starting with shutter speed. Think of the camera shutter as a curtain that opens and closes in front of the camera sensor. And the shutter speed determines how long it's open and it's measured in fractions of a second. You'll see shutter speeds as fast as 1 4,000th of a second or faster and as slow as 30 seconds, sometimes slower. So let's go back to the slow-mo footage we just saw. In this example, the camera shutter was set at 1 over 0.5, which is 2 seconds. So the moment the button was pressed to take a picture, the sensor takes in light for 2 seconds and then it closes. That light gives the camera information which is then processed into the resulting image. The longer the shutter speed, the longer the sensor is exposed to light and that means two things. A brighter image, but also more motion blur. It's exactly how long exposure photography works, like this photo. The cliff, trees, and rocks look normal and that's because it's not moving. But the water has a fuzzy look to it and that's the motion blur. There's even different niches in photography that specifically use long exposure. It's the contrast between moving and stationary objects that make good long exposure shots. But when it comes to video, I don't see much except maybe movies or music videos where there's like a, some sort of scene that uses motion blur to get a trippy effect. Aside from that, there's time lapses and hyperlapses, which are long exposure photos stitched together to make a video. Now a shorter shutter speed does the opposite, takes in less light for a shorter amount of time, meaning a darker image, but also less motion blur. Speeds like 1 1,000th of a second or faster is used a lot in sports or getting footage of wildlife where you want to capture a fast moving subject and freeze it in motion. And it's the same idea for video. Actually, in films like Saving Private Ryan, faster shutter speeds were used as opposed to the cinema standard. With all the action going on, the explosions, a faster shutter speed allowed them to capture movements more clearly. But of course, that was their preference. No specific shutter speed is necessarily better than the other, and that goes with all camera settings. For most situations, you want to follow the 180 degree rule, which is basically a shutter speed that's double the frame rate. And that's the standard because it's known to get the most natural movement, the closest level of motion blur that the human eye sees in real life. For example, this video shot at 24 frames per second, which means the ideal shutter speed would be double 1 over 48. And if I was filming at 60 frames per second, then I'd put the shutter speed to 1 over 120. So that's it for shutter speed. Next up is aperture. It's another mechanical system that regulates light just like shutter speed. The only difference is that shutter speed is happening in the body of camera while aperture is happening in the lens. They look like blades that make the opening in the lens more wide or narrow and it's measured in f-stops. So here's the tricky part. The lower the f-stop, the higher the aperture and vice versa. It sounds confusing I know because it's backwards but basically a lower number means a wider opening that lets more light in. Same thing with a higher number, means the opening is more narrow, letting less light in. And aperture affects two things, brightness and depth of field, which is the distance between the nearest and farthest objects that are in focus. And we have an example right here. My lens, the one that I'm using, is currently set at its widest at f1.4. And by the way, my camera uses a micro four thirds sensor, so any f-stop I say, it'll be double for a full frame sensor, and I'll cue that on screen every time. But anyways, f1.4 or f2.8 for full frame. It's focused on my face and the background is kind of blurry, what's called shallow depth of field. A lot of people like this effect, not just for talking head videos like this. It can get you really good looking shots in a cinematic sequence. You can bring more attention to a specific subject, make a close up shot look more dramatic and do focus pulls to bring attention from one subject to another. Now with a higher f-stop, I'm actually gonna change it on the camera right here. What you get is a darker image and a deeper depth of field. And that's something that you'd want to do if you want to get more subjects in focus. As you can see, my background isn't as blurry and of course the footage is now darker. And just to confirm, I'm gonna bump up the light, oh wow, a lot. 
<laughs> and again, the background, there's still a little bit of a difference, but it's not as blurry as before. Every lens has a maximum aperture, which you could see on the full product title, like this one right here. On B&H, this is the product name of the lens and the max aperture is right here. And if you look closely, it's also engraved right here. Depending on the lens, you'll see f-stops as low as f1.4, sometimes lower, and almost all of them will go up to f16 or f22. And that's a factor that plays into how people buy their lenses. People like to look for a faster lens, which is camera jargon for a lens with a wide aperture. Last but not least, we have ISO. And unlike shutter speed and aperture, which regulates light mechanically, ISO does it digitally. Basically, the higher the number, the brighter your image. And this is useful in low light situations where you need extra brightness. Like right now, it's low light, you can hardly see my face. So one thing that I can do, up the ISO. So I'm gonna do that right now. And there, you can kind of see my face a little bit better. But higher sensitivity to light also means higher sensitivity to noise more grain in the image. Also, the quality won't look as good since you're losing dynamic range and color accuracy. And every camera has its own limits. Some that aren't the greatest in low light, like my Panasonic GH5, can't, in my opinion, go over 1600 ISO before showing noticeable grain. But something good in low light, like the Sony a7 III, can go a lot higher. Now, that doesn't always mean that the lowest ISO a camera could go is the best. Generally speaking, for most cameras, lower levels are better, but sometimes going too low can affect the image in a bad way too. There's a happy medium called native ISO, which is the most ideal, the default you don't want to set your camera at. Every camera has one, and whichever one you have, you can look it up. Just know that researching native ISO can end up being like a really long and complicated debate, especially online. I wouldn't get too caught up in it. For my camera, I found a few articles saying ISO 200 was the best, some say 400, I'm not sure how true it is, but I stick with 200 and it works just fine. So that's my default. And if the lighting situation calls to bump it up or down, then I'll do so accordingly. So I'm gonna show you guys how I would usually expose my shots and what order I prioritize my settings, which is shutter speed first, then aperture, then ISO. And we're gonna use this video as an example again. It's being filmed at 24 frames per second, and I always follow the 180 degree rule and have my shutter speed set at one over 48, or in this case, one over 50, because that's what my camera can go to, unless I'm going for a different look or using a higher frame rate. When it comes to aperture, I like using a low f-stop like f1.4 for close to mid shots like this, a talking head video. If it's a wide establishing shot, I tend to use a higher f-stop like f3.5 to get more in focus and of course if you're going really wide like an entire landscape bumping it higher would be the way to go and of course i'm using my native iso at 200 so these are my ideal settings but it's easy to get this because i'm indoors and i could control the lighting but what if it was too dark similar situation like with the iso example but my aperture is already cranked up all the way and I can't lower my shutter speed anymore because there'd be too much motion blur. And I could take up my ISO, it seems like the only thing that I can do at this point, but if I take it too far, then it gets too grainy. When you're in a bind like this, the only thing you can do is use lights, use a camera that's better in low light, or use a lens with a wider aperture or a combination of those three. And that's just how it is. Now let's say you're outdoors in broad daylight. With the ideal settings that I mentioned, it's just way too bright. My ISO can't go any lower, so what I could do is I could up the shutter speed or f-stop or both so I could get away with a little less natural motion blur. I could get away with not having as much of a blurry background, but sometimes it's just too bright like right now. Even with adjustments that I made, it's still a little bit too overexposed right here. And I could keep pushing it, but at some point the motion blur would be way too unnatural and I'd lose my depth of field completely. So a common solution for this would be an ND filter. And I have one right here. You'll hear this analogy a lot, but they're like sunglasses for your camera. Mine is variable, so you could actually twist and adjust exposure that way so I'm gonna bring back my settings and put the ND filter on and see how it looks so I have the ND filter on right now and it looks pretty good so far as you can see it's a variable so I could like just twist it right on the head of the lens 
and adjust it however I may. I get the same good exposure from just cranking up the shutter speed and aperture without having to actually crank up the shutter speed and aperture. So I get to keep my depth of field, I get to keep my natural motion blur, and I get to have good exposure with the ND filter. So let's recap. Shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. They all affect one unique trait and brightness. And that's why you can't use one without considering at least one of the other two. It's up to you to determine how you want to balance them. And that about wraps it up. Hope this video was helpful and let me know what you guys think. It's like my, my first time doing something like this. So I'll take all the feedback that I could get. But yeah, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you guys on the next one.